Good afternoon. I'm Judy Woodward, the history coordinator of the Ramsey County Library, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you today to this Tuesday Scholar event. Our speaker today is Todd Lefko, who will speak on the topic Russia and the United States, Old and New Enemies. Todd Lefko is president of the International Business Development Company. He has business and academic ties with Russia going back 30 years. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota with the financial support of the Friends of the Ramsey County Library. We are deeply grateful to both these organizations. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Todd Lefko, on the topic, Russia and the United States, Old and New Enemies. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Uh, let me try and turn my... Okay, um, I'll get to the slides in a few minutes, but I want to set a context. You know, it's, it's really interesting that um, I truly wish we were all sitting crowded into the community room at Roseville Library. That's my, going to be my judgment of the fact that life has returned to some form of normality. And I wish that were happening at this moment. The, <clears throat> you watch this idea of Stephanopoulos asking Joe Biden, you know, is Putin a killer? And the answer is yes. And then Putin responds immediately to the, the idea that it takes one to know one. You know, there's an old Russian folk saying that talks about the idea that we see the world from our own church towers. We build assumptions, we build context, we build understanding of how we see the world. And the problem is that we're seeing it from different standpoints, both in the United States and in Russia. And you watch this idea of reset and you sometimes wonder whether reset happens. Karl Marx, you know, Karl Marx, we remember, is the only Marx brother without a sense of humor, once noted that history repeats itself, first as tragedy and then as farce. And the question becomes, are we still living in the past? You know, the world has changed, but many of our mentalities remain the same. And right now, in a period of liberal democracy under siege across the world, the United States and Russia don't speak, we don't trust, and we cannot ignore each other. So the issues are start to, start to continue. How do we live in a world in which over 90% of the nuclear weapons are controlled by either Russia or the United States? And we fear an accidental warfare. We watch the idea of the fights over solar winds or the idea of trying to influence the election in terms of, in terms of uh, Trump. And believe me, Biden and his people know that and understand it well. And we still see this Cold War mentality, which is maintaining, while we're seeing increasing tensions in the Baltics, Syria, Libya, Iran, and other locations, which are continuing to grow and fester across the world. There are always new events forming, but there are some turning points that are more, more pronounced than others. And right now, this is one of those turning points. What we're seeing is that we're seeing this happening when a context where the power relationships across the world are changing. The nature of how the United States and, and Russia relate to each other are different than they are before. Winston Churchill once noted, Russia is never as strong as she appears. Russia is never as weak as it appears. And there's a great deal of truth to that. We started watching the idea of the role of China and the rise of China, where it's not a two-sided relationship anymore, but at least a three-sided relationship and possibly even more. Fareed Zakaria talks about the rise of the rest with India and the other new players. We start to see Bolsonaro in Brazil, Orban in Hungary. We see Erdogan, Erdogan in Turkey. We start to see the role of Modi fighting against and, and doing the persecution of Muslims you know, in India. And we start to see the growth of nationalism and populism across the world that didn't happen 20 and 30 years ago we start to see shifts, which some places continue in terms of, and yet at the same time, shifts in the nature of the relationship with Europe, which change the context of how we're all dealing with Russia and with China right now. So it's not simply a question any longer of a question of the size of your military. We've got all these nuclear weapons, but it's more than that. 
when a kid sitting in Siberia using solar winds or a group in St. Petersburg basically can try and shut down or access, you know, a good share of your fundamental systems, the nature of the world has changed. You don't need an extra 500,000 troops. You don't need an extra aircraft carrier. Um, Comey was talking when he was Comey, when James Comey was at the CIA, he said, he said, I mean, there are two kinds of big Chinese companies in the United States. There are those who've been hacked by the Chinese and those that don't know they've been hacked by the Chinese. And when a kid, I mean, my model perfectly is the idea of Osama bin Laden sitting in a cave in Afghanistan planning a 9-11 attack. The nature of asymmetry has changed. And we're starting to see this idea where we're, we followed four years and longer probably when the United States is losing its luster across the world, when we're still questioning the model of capitalism as a successful model against inequality and the idea of democracy as the most efficient form, which it's not, but it's the one we've chosen because it's the best system of government. The images of capitalism and democracy have both suffered and changed. And the question becomes right now, how do we remake our image so that the you know, democracy and capitalism stand out? And what's the reality? And right now you're seeing an increase in the growth of complexity theory because of predictability of China and the rest have changed the number of factors and the numbers of players that are there. So complexity theory starts to magnify and it becomes more difficult to predict what the future will be. You can watch the trend lines and most of the trend lines are negative right now. We're seeing this idea where we're doing things, Russians pushing back, we're pushing back, and it's, it's um, called the Red Queen hypothesis, where everyone matches each other. And the question is that most of these trend lines are not good. There's a great deal of danger in these. Dmitry Trenin, who's a brilliant mind at Carnegie Moscow, says, everything will get worse, and then it will become worse. You know, and and when you start watching the Kennan Institute pointing out there's less emphasis in the United States on Russia, you know, this idea where it was us and the Russians and Russians is the evil empire and we were the good people, you know, has set the mentality which continues where no matter what Russia does, basically both Republicans and Democrats are suspicious and for good reason, because after, because many of these things are deserved in terms of Ukraine or human rights or the elections. These are legitimate questions. And we still have this Manichaean zero sum approach to the world where we assume that all of these people are gonna do bad and do, you know, and that they're winners and losers. And that for us to win, Russia has to lose. And the Russians give the same kind of view where for an expansion of Putin's view, basically, and, and we'll talk about this, that he figured he can't match the United States the own body and in terms of the idea of investment, because their economy, I mean, we're close to 21 trillion and they're close to 1.7, you know, they can't do a 1.9 trillion package here, you know, that all they can do is try and drag us down to their level. And that's the mentality that you're seeing. Russia at this moment is feeling alone. It's trying to build ties with China and wherever it can, but it feels alone. The traditional Russian historical view is Tsar Alexander III who said Russia has but two allies, its army and its navy. Now, what we are watching is this idea that the old rules on avoidance of conflicts start to get up in spheres of influence. The Russians never understood why we accepted the idea of a Monroe Doctrine, where we had control over anybody going to Cuba or Venezuela or anyone in our region, but that we never understood it with the Russians having the same rights and they always felt this was an unfair advantage that the United States was taking. We're starting to see Russians where they'll push to the point where they think the United States will react strongly and then the Russians will pull back. This idea of, um, of having a direct confrontation is beyond the Russian mind at this moment, whether it's the idea of Syria, Eastern Europe, Libya, NATO, or Venezuela. The Russians right now are trying to do a modernization of their, of their nuclear capabilities, their delivery systems. The New START Treaty only covers, you know, the intermediate or some technologies. It doesn't cover the new medium sized technologies um, and the weapons that are, that are low 
own nuclear capabilities that basically we need to you know, talk about in the space weapons in, in the future. So we're seeing a difference in the Russian concept of the spheres of influence and how we define them in that way. Now, there's been a focus then on this areas of continuing conflict, but there's a lot of areas that we still need to talk about, whether they're the idea of nuclear armed proliferation, the Arctic terrorism in a different way than they are, you know, Iran, Syria, North Korea, uh, vaccines, the control of access to the internet, the idea of climate control, which is a major issue in Russia right now, the pandemic, you know, the idea of trade and weapons and wheat, where Russia has moved ahead, the organization of international financial architectures, the idea of the role of the dollar, visas, fishing agreements, which have become a major issue, the placements of U.S. missiles in, in Europe, Nord Stream, which is really a fight over who's going to control energy in the future. And the future of energy is going to be very difficult for Russia because as we shift away from the idea of uh, fossil fuels, Russia is going to be a loser. But Russia fig hasn't figured out what to do about this. The Saudis and the Russians are going to be the losers in this in the long run. And the Russians comprehend it, but they don't know what to do and they don't have the capability at this point to act because they've they control the market based upon oil and gas, which is basically 41% of their budget at this moment. You know, and so you see these areas that are there to talk about, but we don't have a process for talking except for the fact of at this moment, basically trying to ignore or trying to, uh, trying to claim other people have done both. And this is happening on both sides right now. So we start watching this idea that the fear of something comes up by accident. Trotsky talked about the idea that may not be interested in war, but war is interested in them. We're seeing this, and the new factor here is China, is that China is not seen just as another competitor, but as the competitor in trade and power, you know, both hard and soft. Russia is not our major competitor with trade. The amount of trade with Russia is fairly small and my company is fairly, you know, a percentage of that. And we are small potatoes, you know, compared to, you know, what most companies are in most countries. We're starting to watch this idea that Russia is continuing their process of seeing themselves as the victim mentality. There's a paranoia which goes back into Russian history where basically, they're surrounded by outsiders that basically want to destroy them. This goes back a thousand years where everyone on the outside is someone who's going to attack or do something evil or terrible to them. You know, you've always had this fight of this idea. And for the Russians, explaining that the world is against them, every time we do a sanction or every time we limit some of their people, Putin says, see, I told you, the Americans are just doing this because they hate us. They're against us and what they're trying to do is weaken our power in the world and all the Russians go, yeah, that makes sense. And we start watching this question of whether rule-based systems, such as the World Trade Organization or other organizations really have a future in the world about what the role of the international architecture is you know, at this point. And we're tying that with Russia to the idea of what Graham Ellison talks about as the Thucydides trap with China where the idea of the lesser growing power always challenges through war, the idea of the established power of China, China you know, fighting against us. So we're asking, you know, we're asking right now is the, well, the old, what used to be the Washington versus Beijing consensus, which is the idea of free market, trade, free trade, the idea of liberal democracy, as opposed to the idea of an authoritarian rule, which is more efficient than democracy, but it, you, lose, you lose all of your civil rights, whether which system is gonna be followed across the world right now. And people are questioning. And there's a great fear across the world about in four years, does Biden disappear and somebody like Trump reappear? And is the United States, is this a long-term trend and where are we going to be? And the people don't know how to deal with us because nobody ever had this as a process within the United States before. And all of this fits within the context of how do our allies judge us you know, and deal with us you know, at this point. We're seeing fights over communication and control right now. Only 3% of Russians right now are on Twitter. 
And yet there's a huge fight on Twitter because the Russians are trying to control it just as they tried to control Facebook and other systems. Because what we're doing is we're establishing different supply systems through communication with a Russian system, the Chinese system, which is fairly strong and shutting out outside forces. The Russians were never able to do that. So they were able to do it with Facebook and, and their system, the Contracte, which basically has replaced Facebook in, in, um, pretty much in Russia, except for the fact they tried to shut down um, message. But practically all of the people in Russia were on Messenger Telegram and all of the power people were on that. So they were never successful on that. So you're watching this process where the unity of technology, which was set up to unite the world, has become a process of authoritarian control with different supply chains in Russia, China, and the West. Right now, technology has become a method which is, which is becoming dangerous for the future of centralization of authority. Right now, there are, the last figures I've seen are 193,000 uh, cameras on the streets of Moscow which take facial recognition and the Chinese have perfected this far more. But you watch the idea of the cell phones where you can start to trace people with using big data and then having facial recognition. And if you think that it's good for a dictator to know where his people are, are at every moment and what they're doing at every moment and what they're thinking as a method of control, you're absolutely correct because that's what's happening. And so we're starting to see this fight about the control of the internet, which is a change from you know, 25, 30 years ago, the impact of visual reality of AI, you know, the images in black and white, which are no longer reality and holograms and the adaption of big data to this, the ability to change, to create pictures and to create false images and target audiences make fake news and the ability to have cyber activities in other countries more pronounced, not just in your own country, but internationally. We're seeing a compression of time where with activities um, continuing constantly with instant communication and pressure for decisions, it changes our time that we're given for, you know, for consideration and examination. Within 10 minutes after Putin made a statement about Putin being a killer, the Russians were already reacting, you know, and before this, it would have taken a great deal of time and a great deal of discussion in terms of the diplomatic relationships. So we're seeing the growth of instant history, both in the United States and in Russia. And we're seeing this idea of the numbers of distributors that with the cell phone, it's not just what most of us grew up with was the idea at 5.30, you watch Walter Cronkite who was relaying the words of God directly to us or the idea of Huntley Brinkley or the idea of Howard K. Smith, they were the gatekeepers. Right now we have billions of gatekeepers that gather, assess and produce and distribute the news. So the nature of the control of information has changed from before. And that's something which is essential. There's incredible pressure within Russia at this moment. And you're watching this idea of Navalny who's in prison and will be in prison for a long time, assuming he lives through, they sent him to one of the worst places where there are beatings and a number of other things. So there's, there's a good chance Putin and Navalny will not come out of this alive. You're seeing that Putin has basically decided he's not even gonna play the game of democracy. Basically what he's gonna do is he's shutting down all the alternatives. You'll still have the facade of an election. You just won't have any opponents. And then you'll declare that you won a 65% margin or whatever it is. Putin is hoping to make fear and distrust of the center, you know, the basic issue here. And trying, you know, and he's hoping like Lukashenko did in Belarus to keep going as long as the issue until the problem is resolved. You know, Right now, you've got, you know, um, you've got this people right now. And in the Russians, there's roughly 117 million people that have seen the video on Putin's palace. And if you have a chance, watch it. It's incredible. Um, and it's about the building that he's built for himself. 
and everyone should have an aqua discotheque in their basement along with a nice hockey rink. I, I think it's probably a new style of architecture, but you've got, you know, 27%, you know, of the, the only, only roughly 2% of the Russians really believe that the Russian government was responsible for the, um, for the uh, poisoning of the Skripals. You've got 55% that don't believe that Navalny was deliberately poisoned inside Russia. You know, you've got 28% that believe the protesters in Russia, according to Levada, which is the Gallup of Russia, that believe that the United States is paying for all protesters to go out, you know, right now for, you know, uh, to, to fight against Putin. So we're seeing this idea where most of the people in Russia still are not accepting this idea of an alternative because they don't believe. What they fear, what the Russian aristocracy and the oligarchs fear is the idea of small numbers of protesters that are not tied to Navalny. Navalny's got a past which is tied to nationalism and the right wing and the uh, anti-immigrant and everything. And, and there is no central force that's there fighting against Putin, especially if you're in prison and you can't run. What they really fear are the economic changes. Food prices are up 7.7% in the last year. You're starting to watch the fact that the average disposable income has only gone up 1.5%. The average real disposable income is down one-tenth from 2013. Sugar is up two-thirds you know, this year, you know, and we're watching this idea 20 years ago. Part of the problem is, is that um, there's so many factors, it's frustrating that you're trying to get across a lot of things. And so, okay, let me, um, we're watching, um, we're watching this question where the fear of internal activity and the, the fear of protests of people fighting against the economic reality right now, the latest Levada had survey had um, had something like um, fifty eight percent said the major issue facing Russia in, in Russia was was the idea of price rises. Forty percent said poverty. Thirty nine percent said corruption and graft. Thirty six said employment. So let me switch now. Um, let me switch now to the slideshow. And Paul, let me make sure I can do this right. Ah, okay. Now, Barry Farber is a writer. In a Russian tragedy, everyone dies. In a Russian comedy, everyone dies, but they die happy. And there's some truth to this. Now, there's a weakening. Let me let me close this. There's a weakening of Putin's position domestically. Right now, only 27% of the people in Russia support United Russia, which is Putin's party. The fear, they lowered, they, they raised the age of pensions and a good share of the pensioners were not happy about that to say, and they protested. And it's this fear of the babushkas, of the grandmothers sitting, pounding on the pots, which they greatly fear in Russia. And people, the younger people now, you've got like a quarter of the people that are under 25 that want to emigrate and probably a higher figure than that. Most of them have never seen any leader besides Putin. And Putin right now is 68. He can stay in until, until 2036 when he's 83. They don't see any change coming for their own lives or a positive change until 2036. You know, and so the question is what kind of future they have. And that's something that the, the Russians really worry about, the Russian governments. There's an ability to control through the use of force. This was the Lukashenko model, where basically what you do is, is that you combine the use of force along with the idea of social technologies that are there. And they've arrested 11,000 people in the protests over Navalny, but it's not just Navalny, it's, for, it's uh, over economics and everything else. And what they're trying to do is trying to silence where kids are kicked out of universities if they protest. You're sent to jail and if you're deaf mute, eh, you can be charged $70 for, you know, for shouting an anti-government um, slogan, you know, or you can be basically jailed if you're sitting there and, and, and sending a tweet forward. Um, we're seeing a lack of infrastructure, partly because of the lack of money. The drop in oil prices in the last year has hurt, the, the, the rise is helping them somewhat. You know, you've got both a lack of investment in physical and social infrastructure. You've got one tenth of the Russian budget now going toward the idea of social control. And the idea that which is second only to defense and 
excuse me, and it's the social control, the idea of uh, internal security and things like that has a greater budget than all of healthcare and education combined in Russia, which shows that it's the maintenance of power. So Navalny had become one of the first leaders that symbolically is there as a martyr and he's dangerous, but there's no clear opposition to Putin. And with the nationalism, Putin's trying to play on that, that the outsiders are trying to control us again. Okay, let me figure out how to do this. Okay, so the fear of the oligarchs is they're gonna be shut off from the world. And that's the real pressure point. And the sanctions have done that to some degree. And the European sanctions, which were announced yesterday, do that to some others, but most of them have money outside the country. Most of my partners have dual citizenships in more than one country besides Russia, and they've got bank accounts outside. So the fear of being trapped is something that they're worried about in case everything you know, collapses inside the Russia. There's a development of Russia outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. There is a growth in a number of areas that we don't think about. Tonight, my organization is doing a, a program at 7.30 on voices from Siberia. Where we're talking with a village and some unbelievably brilliant people out there in technology and other things out there. So there is growth across the country in terms of the idea of, of we think of just Moscow and St. Petersburg. But in reality, what's happened is when you've got 11 time zones, um, it's like people coming to the United States and seeing and saying, I've seen New York, I now want to completely understand the United States. There is a good share of Russia that's totally outside and feeling totally unrelated to Moscow and St. Petersburg. We're seeing the role of workers from the South Many of the Tajiks and people from the former, you know, the, the, the former Central Asia who were providing the major supplies to their country in terms of financial support by sending money home. Most of those people are home at the moment, and it's been a tremendous issue in Tajikistan and some of the other areas in the south. There's a legal dispute over art where, where it's not safe for the Russians to send pictures to the United States because there's a good chance they'll be confiscated as part of a lawsuit over Hebrew art, which happened out of a fight in New York, we're starting to see the energy relationships with, with, that are being tied to the idea of Nord Stream 2, which is truly, there's a lot of people that don't believe it really is needed. The United States role wants people to buy liquefied natural gas from the United States instead of buying it in gas from Russia. And so this is partly one where it's the future of energy, but it's also the question of the future of supply of energy for a good share of Europe. You're watching continuing fights on the Donbas, on the Crimea, on the role of uh, Vladimir Zelensky and whether Zelensky will be able to be successful. The Russians want him to collapse because they want the return of Russian control of, of the government of Ukraine, which is not gonna happen anytime soon because they, the, 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 most of the people of, of Ukraine, not in Donbas, but the other areas are become so violently anti Russian, that it's difficult to have in conversations. We're developing, as I mentioned, such a separate social media and information systems. The Russians are trying to do joint actions in terms of military and economic and trade with China against the United States. This is a form of relationship, though in reality, the Chinese view the Russians as a one trick pony in terms of oil and gas. They don't see them as equals. And what you're watching is this idea that the, China, the Russians seem to understand this but they can't do much about it. They're still supplying military weapons until the Chinese catch up, at which point the Chinese will totally ignore them. We're starting to see a smart voting strategy by Navalny and the others, where if they can't run their own candidates, because most of their candidates have been cut out, basically what they do is they basically vote for the candidate, which would be the most likely to be opposed to the government. And they've been successful in a number of the local races. And since the next parliamentary elections are coming up in September, that's the strategy that will be used, even though Navalny's people will probably only qualify a few people, you know, just to show that there's some outside possible. The question becomes, is democracy possible in Russia? I argue with my friends there about this. They claim it's not because they claim the Russian mentality would not, would not allow democracy. I disagree with them totally. And I think that the potential is there. Now, on our side, the United States by young Russians is no longer seen as the model for the young. They're going to the EU, to Germany, Canada, Australia. Wanting to leave and go somewhere is still, still a pattern. 
but many of them don't see the United States as the place where they can come to as opposed to the idea where it was 20 years ago. Every young Russian wanted to come here. Now very few think this is the model of what, they, what the future is gonna be. We're starting to see the emergence of some Russian companies on the world stage, not just the idea of wheat and the idea of, of uh, Rosneft in terms of uh, oil or, or Gazprom in terms of gas, but some technological companies that are doing inventions that are really, that are really a world-class level, but it's often in, a, in a very limited, limited areas. There's a belief in Russia that it's a great country, but being ignored by the world. And part of this is the sense of paranoia and part of it's the sense of martyrdom that's there, the sense of victimhood. There's a belief in Russia that they are the last bastion of world morality and the protection of values of family, religion. There's a sense that the United States is basically decadent and on its way to hell. And I, I'm, you know, and I don't know how else to put it, that in terms of religion, in terms of the idea of anti-gay rights, in terms of the idea of fighting against many of the rights for women, they see this as a challenge to the traditional family values. And they see Russia as the one protector of these bastions of past moralities in the world. And that's going to be a very difficult and slow process to change. You start to see the role of private entrepreneurs that are tied to the government, Wagner. Um, and Prigozhin. Wagner is an organization that Prigozhin and Prigozhin is one of, the, one of Putin's closest friends. He's Putin's chef. And basically he's formed Fancy Bear and these organizations out of St. Petersburg that are all the cyber organizations. They are the army. Wagner is the army when troops, Russian troops are sent to the Ukraine and they claim they're not government troops, but they're private entrepreneurs those are Wagner. When they're saying, when you start to see 300 Russians show up in central Congo or parts of Africa, those are Wagner. It's government money, but it allows the Russian government to claim these are not government Russian activity, the governmental Russian activities. These are basically private. And the truth is these are all government. The idea of Putin's palace showing the impact of social media across the world where you can show certain things have changed. The question is whether anyone believes them right there. Wheat, Russia since 2016 has become one of the major wheat importers. The question of climate, which is tied to this, you've got Russia, which will be one of the most impacted countries in the world. You've got only 8% of the country, which is arable right now. And yet you've got a process where, where you're gonna have all of this area of the North, which is going to be um, in deep trouble because the permafrost is melting. And it's not going to be able to expand their, their production a lot. It's going to hurt their oil and gas. And climate change will allow them to come through the northern Arctic more easily, which is why Arctic becomes such a major issue. But still is limiting their ability to basically control you know, the idea of what they think their future can be. The Russian mentality, and this is central, Russians don't mind if they're feared. Russians don't mind if they're hated but a Russian cannot be ignored. And, and I wanna emphasize that, that, that the sense of being left out of the discussion for them, Russia always have to be at the table. And the poisoning, they don't believe they can do this, that they believe that they've got certain rules. You know, they believe that they've got the right to do whatever it is they choose to do. Now, the elements of the foreign policy, and then let me open it up for questions or we'll, we'll do whatever we want. Um, they want to be accepted as an equal and great power and respected. The truth is, is that outside of the nuclear weapons, they've got the, the human potential, the human capability to do this, but they're not investing in their human infrastructure in terms of health and education and what the base is going to be for the future. But not that's not in the Russian mentality. They're seeing this as the idea about why doesn't the world understand that we're equal? Why doesn't they understand that we're the power? It believes it's alone that only through their military strength will they have any position of power. And so they can't be a superpower because of their economics. And there really is the fear that they're gonna be bankrupted in any direct competition. So they'll go up to the point, but they won't go beyond it. And that when you've got the natural resources, this is the Dutch disease, the natural resources like oil and gas that are foundations of oil and foreign and domestic policy, you know, it's you live by the jump shot and you die by the jump shot. 
and they haven't diversified. The Saudis are trying to diversify as quickly as possible. The Russians haven't figured out how to do it. They named a number of areas where they were gonna do this, and yet all of a sudden, all of them disappeared. Putin announced they were gonna be one of the top five economies in the country in a few years. That's not mentioned anymore. That part has disappeared, or it's put off to a bar 2030 or 2035 which means it's not gonna happen because the money is not going there. And so Russia needs a relationship with the world for their economy. There's a fight internally between the people that are the oligarchs where money is being centralized within the country as opposed to those people that wanna change the economy and open it up for greater entrepreneurship from people that often don't have access to the, to the political ties and political ties, and it's called a block, block there, which means influence. Those are the central factors of, of relationship there. Um, and so they know what they need to do, but they're not doing it. So, and they want to have control over their borderlands, over former Eastern Europe, and especially over the area of the South and the Chinese, um, the new systems that are coming out of China. In terms of the uh, in terms of the um, uh, Silk Roads that are being developed, are going to change that because most of the areas of the South are building relationships with China rather than Russia. And what the Russians really want is to split the world three ways in the spheres of influence with the U.S. and China. The rest of the world doesn't want that. And whether that's uh, that's really going to happen, that's different than what the Russians want and what their goals are. And the problem is that we need a strong state domestically, and this is true for the United States and for Russia, as a precondition for advancing international interests. Unless the United States is strong domestically, we'll never be strong internationally again. And so what they've done is they've done the asymmetrical warfare, the Grasimov, which is the idea of trying to increase the amount of things that you do to weaken others by cyber along with the idea of military actions like small numbers of troops in Libya or Syria. You know, what you want from a Russian standpoint is a frozen conflict like you got in Ukraine, where basically you don't want anyone else to take control, but you don't want them to be able to take any action right there. Now, it'll challenge the United States when it senses a vacuum and then it backs away. It wants to be defined to any central, to any international settlement, it has to be at the table. And it needs to be viewed as capable of advanced information and cyber warfare, which is one of the things that cyber and information allows them to do, totally regardless of the amount of investment that you make in terms of weapons. And Russia is trying to show that it with, can withstand any foreign actions, any sanctions, any attacks, partly by explaining that the rest of the world is against them, and partly by showing that as the power through cyber or through military weapons to basically balance off any threat that's there. And, and it's what it's showing is that any attack basically will cause the attackers more problems than, than it will you know, produce in terms of um, any action against Russia. Russia sees itself as a European power. And there's a great fight right now within Russia intellectually about is it a special Eurasian power, which is different than Europe and Asia? Is it a power totally unto itself? Russia is valuing realism and not idealism. And so, I mean, wait a second. Now, you've got land mass 1.8 size at the time in the United States. It's got 11 time zone, second largest crude oil exporter. Oil, gas, and armaments are 90% of their exports right now. It since it's the world's largest wheat export right now, you only got 8% of land arable. You know, we sit there and we're proud of uh, 10,000 lakes. They've got 2 million lakes. You know, Baikal, which is the sister lake for Superior, is the largest freshwater lake. You've got 41% of the government revenue from oil and gas. So that oil goes down, so does the government options, so do governmental options at that point. You know, it's less than one tenth the economic size. So this isn't an economic fight. This is a fight for perceived power and however power is defined in the world. They've got 144 million people, but they're losing a number of hundreds of thousands every year because their birth rate is low. You know, we're at roughly 323, a little higher than that. 
Um, most of these I can skip over. They've got 17% of the world's crude oil. They've got 25% of the world natural gas, 6% of coal, 70% of oil, commercial iron, 10 to 20% of all non-ferrous rare metals. They've got the potential to do what they want, but they don't have the human capability and the organizational capacity to take advantage. They could have been one of the leaders in the world, but they centralized the economy so greatly that they've damaged themselves on this. You've had this tremendous traumatic thing in the last 30 years. And 1991, you got 25 million Russian citizens and 37 million Russian speakers. Suddenly the next day we're without a country. And so all of a sudden you've had these changes and people don't know how to adjust to that. And it's caused tremendous fights you know, within, the, within domestically, and in their areas around in Tajikistan and, 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 and um, Uzbekistan and the other areas in the South. Now, the Russian government, what they did was when they started hitting the 2008 financial crisis, they built up as many funds when oil was still high as possible. From 1999 to 2008, they were growing at roughly um, seven, a little over 7% per year. Since 2009, they've basically been growing at roughly 1.1%. The effects of sanctions have been to decrease their GDP by roughly 1% to 1.5% per year. So it has had an impact. It has an impact on the import of new technologies into oil and gas, and it's, and it's provided limits on the access to international financial support for some of their investments um, and some of their growth. But a good share of things like food, when you go into a Russian market, they've got Lay's potato chips and they've got Coke and Pepsi and, and the McDonald's, all the things that are there are produced locally in Russia now. So the idea of outside sanctions on bringing stuff in hasn't had the same impact on food as it has had in technology and some of the other areas. Listen, let me, um, Judy, um, I can yes. keep going. Um, I can open it up for questions or do whatever you want at this moment. Sure, we can start with questions. If you're ready to take questions, I would ask you to stop sharing your screen so that everybody can see you. Okay. We've got a number of okay. comments Let me saying, stop oh, perfect. Okay. okay. All right, and now I will say to the audience, um, this is your turn to ask your questions for Todd Lefko, but please, when you ask your questions, put them in the Q&A <coughs> column so that I get to them in the order that they were asked, not the chat column. So, okay, let's start. Um, our first question says, what is, China, what is Russia's approach with China? How does Russia approach the US and China? Does Russia play the two one against the other? What what is the uh, model there? Okay, um, you see this over the last number of years. You've seen a, a changing relationship. Nixon, because he wanted to form an anti-Russian alliance, did the opening to China. And the same thing is happening in reverse. And, and there's two factors that are here. One is the Russian reaction of seeing themselves as equal to China. So doing trade, joint military activities and, um, and trying to do things like um, uh, as many agreements as possible. You've got, you've got uh, a 2,500 mile border between China and Russia there. You've got about 7 million Russians on one side and 100 and some million Chinese on the other. So, the, the Russians see this as, a, as an equal factor, which will form a strong block against the United States. The Chinese, as I mentioned, see this as a, Russia as a one trick pony. And the Russians basically don't want to accept that. They understand they don't have the capability. The Chinese are still buying large amounts of Russian military weapons because they're more advanced than the Chinese have done. But the Chinese will copy them and do their own weapons and will stop buying from the Chinese and from, from the Russians, I think very quickly. So a couple of questions come up. Number one, what is our best strategy in the United States to try and split that? You know, is this possible? Because China sees itself in a different role than it did years ago also. Secondly, is there a way of really dividing because the Russians, um, the Russians 
haven't seen any benefit or great benefits of dealing with the United States. They still think the United States lied to them. They still, Putin is still convinced that Hillary Clinton basically um, organized the protests against him in Bolivia Square in 2013. And, and she remembers that very deeply. Um, the, um, um, when Biden saw Putin a number of years ago and he said, um, I've at Bush had said, I look in your eyes and I see your soul. Biden said, I look in your eyes and I see there's no soul. And, and, um, and Putin's reaction was, we understand each other completely. So building a relationship with China because personalities become involved in international relationships. And so the answer is, at this moment, we're trying to find us um, a method of splitting the relationship, but at this moment, it's extremely difficult, partly because of and partly because of the growth factor of China. Okay, um, China has been uh, increasingly aggressive in the world uh, sphere these days. Uh, is China going for a land grab of Russian territories? There's, um, there's two factors that are here. One is the idea that you're seeing more and more Chinese moving across the border. And there was a joke in Russia that when the last Russian leaves Siberia, will they please turn off the lights? And, um, and so you're having the fact that you may have de facto as opposed to de jure, that you may have enough Chinese farmers um, entrepreneurs, businessmen that are there because the numbers of people are so massive that in effect that it's still theoretically part of Russia, but in reality it's controlled by most of the, by most of the Chinese. So that's, that's the reality that's happening. I don't know if they wanted land grab because it's more trouble than it's worth. If you basically control everything, why go through the political fights? You're having the same question now in Hong Kong and in Taiwan. Hong Kong, they had the ability from the British. And it was interesting, they hated the British, but they hated the Chinese even more. They didn't want either, but it wasn't the option. And the 50 year delay has been suddenly shortened in time. And, and so the question right now with Taiwan is, if there's a land grab, will they do that? And right now, the whole question of, of Chinese building small islands right through the China Sea, number one. Number two, an expansion of what Chinese declare as their, their space um, of what, uh, because you get a certain number of miles from Chinese territory. You keep moving the islands out and then you declare that it's 50 miles from there. So that the United States is always invading Chinese territory. There's a greater danger of the Chinese trying to do this by what's called the salami method where you just have a little cut at a time. And if, they're, if they get to the point of Taiwan, that means they figure the United States is too weak. Right now, there's a saying in Beijing that the East is rising and the West is declining. Now, at which point psychologically does the, do the Chinese feel that the United States doesn't have the power, the strength or the integrity or the, um, the capability or the desire right now to answer Chinese aggression in Taiwan? And that's a serious question. And that's a perception, um, that's a perception where misperception becomes truly the danger. Okay, there are a lot of questions in the Q&A column about uh, Russia's relationship with China, uh, but here is one. What does Russia think about the Middle East? Uh, how does the Middle East figure into this tripartite, uh, you know, three-way, three centers of power global structure that Russia is interested in creating? Okay, you've got three or four factors that are there. First, you've got the idea of Syria. Syria provided a warm water um, um, base for the Russians that have always wanted a warm water port. Secondly, was the fact that you've had long-term relationships militarily with many of the militaries in the Middle East when there was still a fight between the United States and Russia, that the oligarchs or the, the authoritarian governments often had relationships where they'd buy Russian weapons 
or that they would the Russians would do the military training for those nations. So you have a number of old ties that were there with Iran and with Syria and with some of the other Middle Eastern countries. Third is, is that because of proximity, you've had a strong number of, of Arabists that have been built up within the academic institutions. And one of my best friends is one of the top Arab ex experts who, who literally got the green book from the hand of Gaddafi. Um, and you've had numbers of people that are there that speak Arabic that have ties and personal relationships are there. You had a number of Russian women that have married um, Arabic officers. So you've got a number of family ties that are there. Um, and then you've got the idea that Russia sees this as a potential where the greater the split with Iran, that Russia can be a salesperson of both atomic nuclear plants and weapons to Iran and increase the, the split between the United States and Iran, which is fairly wide at this moment. Secondly, is, is that as I mentioned before, um, um, with Bashar al-Assad in Syria, for a small investment of troops, they basically had access to control of the country. And so from the Russian perspective, this was a brilliant investment. The one in Libya, um, there's a fight right now in um, North Africa in, one the, in the civil war there on um, whether the Russians have chosen the wrong side. Um, but you're seeing more and more Russian troops show up in various spots in, um, you know, throughout Africa. Um, you've got this thing where the Russians see the Middle East as a market for more military and other, uh, other factors. Secondly, is they see it as part of the part of their soft power block, you know, against the United States, because there's serious questions because of the religious splits, because of the fight of what our future is with the Saudis, because of the question of can the United States really defend most of the areas um, that are there in terms of the, the fight. Um, you've, got, you've got the Turks got the um, Sunnis and uh, that all of these become factors for potential splits and threats to the United States. And the more the United States gets involved with their, that, the less they're gonna they're challenge the Russians in a number of other areas. So the Middle East is extremely important. The Middle East is, is traditional and it's historical and the Middle East is evident and, and what they're sensing is the United States is tired. Hmm. We'd like to get out. The whole question of what happens in Afghanistan, the whole question of what we do, you know, that, that Americans are somewhat tired of war. And most of those are wars and that the interest has shifted from the Middle East to the, to the idea. And, and so we created a vacuum when our interest is going to the Far East, that basically the Middle East becomes an area where Russians can move into with very little military or, or effort because we've left. Okay. All right. Uh, this questioner asks, what was the video you recommended that each of us should watch? Did you have a video recommendation in the course of the time? No, I, I mentioned that there's a program on tonight on, um, on ties with uh, Siberia. And that's on, um, I can put it in, do I put it in a chat box or where do I put it? Sure, you can put it in the chat box or if it's easy for me to, to if you can easy, if you want, it's easier for you, me to just do it myself, you can tell me too. Okay, it's WRABCC.org, which is the Russian American Business Culture Council. That's on at 7.30 tonight. And um, that's a, and then go when you said, on the that's our organization that I'm president of, and it's the um, go to events and then register there, and that that's on 7:30 tonight, and it's with some of the brilliant people in um, Siberia. One of the guys was tops in a in artificial intelligence and financial technology, and um, Ivan is a truly good guy, and the, his wife is the American who's the writer for the Nation magazine, and they've got the local deputy from the person. So that's the only thing that I mentioned that in terms uh, of- uh, Give oh, me the- The other video, video, I'm sorry. Video is Putin's palace. Just put it in uh, Putin's palace. Okay, yeah, but give put me the- Putin's palace. And, and a hundred, uh, the last figure I saw was 117 million views. So um, you won't be alone. And it's amazing. 
Um, if you want to build a house, that's the way to build it. Except that the fact that they discovered that there were too much mold, they torn part of it down because the Russian construction had been so poor that they had to figure out what to do to restore it. And there's a question of whether it will ever be finished. Okay, let's go on. So Putin's palace is the one I think that this uh, yeah. viewer was asking about. Um, and another question, this is an interesting one. Are you ever worried about your personal safety because you are uh, frank and sometimes critical about Putin and the government of Russia? You know, I, I was the writer for 18 years for, for Yeltsin and Putin's paper. I was the front page. Um, um, here, this is the presidential paper of Russia. And um, here I am in the front <laughs> page. And um, there were moments, um, two levels here. One is the level that, that I became aware of, of, that I would write an article, I've done almost 700 articles, and, and, and I would be aware that there were, if I were interpreted correctly or misinterpreted, I was in great danger. And I called up one day, there was the, I, I called up uh, Dima Zantaya, who was my interpreter, and because um, I can do, I can be on the streets and be in restaurants, things like that, but my Russian is not good enough to do serious business things or to write, write serious articles there. So, it was, and I said, what time does the paper come out? And he said, six o'clock. I said, if this line isn't changed at 610, you'll be dead. And, um, and the line was changed. And so I had people protect me. I was more worried about one of my, um, I was dating this woman whose husband was a KGB colonel. And that provided more moments of danger to me than, than some others. I've usually find, found that you can be frank and honest with people if you present it in a way where both things are, are, are balanced, you know, where you're trying to show that this is not just anti-Russian, but it's a context that both people are doing things. And, and so I would often phrase things like, as many world leaders would say, or something like that, that's, you know, that's what you would try and, you know, um, put it. And I never, I never worried. Um, people have been very good to me. And, and I, plus I've built, after 32 and a half years now, I, a lot of my friendships go up fairly high in the, in the system. And people have protected me in a number of cases. So. Yeah. And we have another question uh, beyond Putin's palace. You also spoke about the uh, event that your group was organizing tonight. And we have uh, someone who asked uh, again for the information about that. So uh, the, I did the www.rabcc.org. And then go RAB, to I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask you because I'm putting it in the chat okay, column. Www. He already put it in the chat comment, Judy. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, All I right. see it right Sorry. there. So okay, you go I'm to www.rabcc.org. Sure. Then go okay. to events and then register. I, I'm not sure everyone saw it because I just got a question about it again. Okay, well, moving on. Is uh, Russia's desire Thank for the... Okay, is Russia's desire for the Ukraine uh, because they need the land to grow wheat because of their arable land shortage? No, there's two factors that are there with Ukraine. Um, and, and Ukraine is a great wheat growing area. In fact, years ago when I was in um, 30, and it's almost 33 years ago, 32 and a half years ago, when I was in Ukraine, I was in Donetsk and in that area. And I thought they would advance far beyond what Russia ever did because they had both technology and the agricultural base and they never did it because they, they screwed up their administrative systems as, they, as in some cases they, they still are. Um, number one, they have great amounts of wheat growing area now. Number two, the interest in Ukraine is basically to make sure that you don't have a strong Western ally next to you. And so what they want is what I call the frozen conflict. They wanna make sure that the Ukrainians can't do anything, that you limit the ability of the Ukrainian government to act. You want the Ukrainian government and Zelensky to fail. And yet what you want is you want the control of the area without responsibility. 
I kidded my friend. I said, take pay pensions and you have to pay for all infrastructure. He said, no, 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 we don't want that. He says, we just want control. <laughs> you know, and that's the, that's the mentality right now is that if you could keep it frozen, Finland was frozen for years. We're frozen, Finland couldn't act against the West or against the East or the West. They were basically neutralized. That's what they want is they want these areas to be neutralized so they can't be a potential danger. Okay. Are Russian oligarchs investing their money in the Russian economy or outside the country? Yes, which is a <laughs> really answer, dumb answer. Yes. <laughs> um, and the answer is yes, because quite frankly, all of them have money outside the country. And, um, and, and if you show me a Russian oligarch that doesn't have money outside the country, I'll show you somebody who's not gonna be around for much longer. Um, most had money in Cyprus. Um, most had money in Switzerland, though, though Cyprus was the favorite. Um, there were some of the islands. <clears throat> in the old days, I, we were on a cruise one time and um, we're on an island in the Caribbean and we, my wife and I are walking through the, through the island and she smiles and says, do you see that nondescript one-story brick building that's there? And I said, yes, she said, that's your bank. And it was the <laughs> Russian bank though, that everything was filtered through, through the place there. Um, right now, um, the Russians, um, most of the oligarchs that right now are fighting over, it, it's what I call the pigs at the trough. They're fighting over control because they don't know how long Putin will stay in power. Their power is tied to the idea of Putin being their friend in a central location where he can distribute the, the wealth of the nation. And the, the fight is over to split up as many positions of wealth and centralization as possible. And so the control is the idea that they're investing, but they're not investing long-term. It's the question of control. And so the idea of infrastructure, or the idea of, of rebuilding oil and gas lines, and many of the oil and gas lines are in tough shape and with climate change melting much of the permafrost, that's even greater danger. You know, and you're seeing problems out in Siberia now where, where because of the, the increased um, heat, you're starting to see the melting and other problems in terms of um, the rivers being flooded and things like that with oil, that these are problems for the, the pipelines out there. So. People basically, um, one of our partners in a few years ago in Cyprus, most of the Russians, or a good share of the Russians had money in Cyprus. And there's two major banks in Cyprus. And one was basically a Russian bank. And I picked up my partner at Indianapolis because we were going to a trade show there. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, you know, he said, I just, the Cypriots just confiscated a million dollars. Actually, it turned out to be 5 million of, of his money that week. He said, it's not been a good week. And I said, uh, what can you do? He said, nothing. He said, they basically, so what happened was the Cypriots then offered him citizenship um, if he bought a hotel and a, and, a, and a home there, which he did. And so he's got Cypriot citizenship also. And, and that's not unusual. You know, Cyprus, Cyprus has basically become a Russian suburb now. And you walk in and all the menus are in Russian and a good share of the TV and other things that are there. And, and you'll start watching these enclaves that are being developed in different countries. Um, you know, they, they've cut off a lot of the travel now because the pandemic to, um, there was a section of Turkey was heavily, you know, that was heavily um, touristic for the Russians, a section of Egypt, which was heavily Russian tourists because there were all these very cheap tours that were, you know, to everywhere. And all of that's been, been cut off. So there's a, the Russians, the middle class has really been threatened in the past year. And they're not the people we're talking about with the oligarchs. The oligarchs have done well. And their inequality is growing. It's not to the level of the American inequality, you know, but it's still there. And as I mentioned with the Levada poll, it's a major function because the middle class is feeling very stressed because they don't see a growth factor for that. Uh, while we're on the subject of banks, uh, could you talk about the supposed uh, Russian influences on Deutsche Bank 
and and then the implications for the Deutsche Bank relationship to uh, Donald Trump. Um, I, I'm harder pressed on that because I don't know all of the. Deutsche Bank has been one of the strong supporters of of um, of Trump and of Trump, some of the Trump investments for a number of years. Um, how that will play out, I honestly, Judy, I don't know. You know, because it's going to be. Um, <clears throat> You get involved with the Deutsche Bank relationships with the central German government and and um, and the independence from the United States and, and there are some of the other factors that are there. My my sense is that that the Deutsche Bank will end up being okay on this, um, just because their power ties and the fact that they're a fairly strong institution. My um, we're in Germany a fair amount of time. My daughter lives there, and so you know. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what to tell you on that one. Okay. That's, not a, that's one where I'm not sure. All right. This questioner says, I was in Russia about eight years ago, and I was struck by there were no signs yeah. of industry, no trucks on the highways, there were no warehouses, et cetera. Additionally, the rural areas seemed poor, and uh, little towns seemed to have no activity. How can they survive without GNP? Well, they do have GNP. It's not at the same level, you know, and it's, and it's lower per person. It's going down. Um, you do see a number of trucks that are there, and it depends on which highway. And I don't know where they were. So, um, what 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 I think is happening here is that you've seen the growth. I mean, one of our businesses is water, and and valves and things for water. And I know we're sending shipments in every month, you know, into Moscow and into Kiev also. And um, at least monthly into Moscow. And what's happened is there's, they're selling all across Russia. And you're seeing a middle class growth where many of the summer houses, the dachas, have become permanent homes, just like our lake homes often have become permanent homes for people who have moved out you know, to Brainerd or up, up north. And we're watching this process now where there is a growth in a number of small towns and, and middle sized towns. And a middle sized town, you know, may. Yeah, well, a couple of million people that's there. There are warehouses, there are industrial areas in almost every section of Russia. You're seeing the growth of Ashan, which is basically the Walmart of Russia. You're starting to see the centralization of things like food and um, um, the food markets and things like that. So you are seeing the trucks. And if you stand, um, if you're on most highways, um, I mean, we go out to one of our factories we work with in Yaroslavl, which is about an hour and about two and a half hours out of Moscow. There's trucks all along the road, you know, and 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 so there are trucks there. Um, if I knew where they were, it might be, you know, more interesting because the growth and even in the last eight years, you see a change. Even in Moscow, which has become one of the world world's most sophisticated centers now, as opposed to the old days. And, and they're, they're right about the idea that in a, if you're in a village, you still swear you're 50 years ago <laughs> with the TV towers and the muddy roads. And um, I, I often think when we're driving in a rural area, I'm afraid that the car is gonna, gonna basically disappear <laughs> because the Russians have developed potholes to a far larger scale than we ever dreamed about in Minnesota. <laughs> so, and that's saying something. <laughs> yes, yes. The next question is, what successes has Russia had uh, with regard to cyber warfare with China? You mean internally with inside of China or along with China? I think they're, they mean uh, against China, but I perhaps I, the I don't know of any I don't know of any cases publicly where the Russians have acted against the Chinese. I know of cases where both the Russians and Chinese have tried to act, you know, against the United States, where mm -hmm. basically what you've done, one of the factors that's happened now is the idea that we've centralized our systems of control of finance, internet, almost everything runs through the internet now. So we've centralized all of our functions at the same time we've decentralized access. So it allows millions of Chinese or Russians to have access 
to whether it's solar winds or the idea of hacking or the idea of getting into into um, um, uh, you know secrets that were there. Um, the Russian, both Russians and Chinese have done that. And part of the thing is, is that, is that some of it's a method of control and some of it's unnecessary because the United States publishes so many of their secrets or of their industrial processes in terms of academic research and things like that. They don't need anybody you know, from outside. They've got you know, people that are here as students, but the Russians have basically been doing this. Um, and like I said, both countries have been doing this against the United States. But they've not just the United States, they've done it in the Ukraine, they've done it in Western Europe. They tried to, they, they supported Marie Le Pen in France. Um, they did it in most of the Western elections too. You know, and so they've been involved. They're not just focused on us, they're focused on trying to, you know, trying to change the West and the cheapest form possible. So, you know, I hope that's the right interpretation of the question. Okay, and I will say to the original questioner, if we misunderstood this question, please put something in the Q&A column and I will read the uh, correction. Um, next question, how soon is travel to Russia going to be safe? You're talking about, uh, you're talking about physically or, you, well, number one, uh, there's three levels here. One is the level of getting visas. And as the embassy staffs have been reduced, access to visas is getting tougher and tougher. Not the approval, it's just the slowdown. And this is a punishment because we're teaching each other lessons as little children often do, that we're not gonna be shoved around and pushed, even though the Russians are seeking to expand the idea of tourism and they tried to create an e-visa for a number of countries, the United States not included, which they've just paused because of pandemic. Um, so the first issue is visa. Second is the question of pandemic and the question of being stuck for 14 days in a hotel, which, in, which now from some of the other countries, you know, you, they're allowing other people back in, though that's, they're worried about, um, um, uh, about how quickly they can provide um, um, the vaccine to everybody, you know, enough of the people. And, and so the, the second level is the, the idea of pandemic. My sense is we're gonna go back as soon as we can. I don't think it's gonna happen for another couple of months, minimal. Third is the idea of personal safety. If you were in Moscow, in most places, and there are places in my side like Moscow, you do not go at night, but there are places in Minneapolis and St. Paul, I won't go at night. So in reality, um, if, you're, if you're in the center of most cities or on most tours, you're absolutely safe. Russians are the funniest, most friendly people in the world. And, um, and you can sit, um, you'll have a great time and I, I encourage everybody to go. If you've been there years ago, you won't recognize it any longer. Mm. Okay. Uh, what in your opinion would be a better way for the US to be relating to Russia going forward? How should we... Uh, restructure our foreign policy toward Russia? Okay, some of it is the idea of wording and the diplomacy and how diplomacy is being done in terms of, you know, yeah, he is a killer, you know, you know, but, you know, but is that the best way to build a relationship? Just as the question of, of the fights with China, how, you know, first is the wording. Secondly, is the idea about what do you focus upon? Do you focus upon the areas of division or the areas of joint activity? Terrorism. Arctic, the idea of, of climate change, which is affecting both countries, not just in the Arctic, but everywhere. You know, all of these things like joint activities on vaccines, all of these things, if you focus, one of the things we're trying to do with our organization is to build as many non-governmental, what's called track two relationships with institutions, organizations, universities, and individuals as possible, because often, governments don't do things that people can. And, and so what's happened is, is that um, stress the points of commonality. You know, right now, nuclear start and, you know, um, start was seen as a method that was logical because killing each other with weapons was really, um, <laughs> you know, and the old joke went, you know, one nuclear day, one nuclear bomb can destroy your entire day. You know, and that we understood, but
But the reality is it's not really getting at what the major issues are. But it's a question of a maintenance of effort in terms of talking. And that will probably be the greatest aspect of this, that it allows you to have a channel. You know, we used to have the phones, you know, the red line and things that basically would go into Moscow between the White House and the Kremlin. We need more of those. And we need the ability to start building up non-governmental relationships and to build up governmental relationships on the areas where we build ties. And you build up, and from our aspect, building as many non-governmental personal ties with institutions and individuals is as important as anything else. And that's what we're focused on doing and we've been doing. Okay, um, why has uh, China been so much better at developing its economy than Russia? You know, there's an interesting concept of national culture. And it was the idea of the, the Chinese leadership. Mao understood that members of the old deal about, I don't care if the black and white, if the cat is black or white, as long as it catches mice. That wasn't Mao, yeah. that was Deng Xiaoping. Oh, uh, Zhao Xiaoping, I understand, I apologize. Deng Xiaoping said, said that in the 1980s. You're correct, you're correct, you're right. And, and it was the idea, they understood that allowing the opening of the economy would be good in the long run. And right now, what's funny is within China, you're seeing a reversal of some of that and you're seeing the fights with Jack Ma and the idea of whether some of the entrepreneurs have gone too far beyond governmental control and whether the Chinese Communist Party, as part of their efforts to establish this and to increase their control, are increasing or limiting the idea of the entrepreneurs. So part of it was the idea of the leadership of China. Secondly, was the idea of the Russian mentality of centralization. Everything had been a top-down, it's called the vertical of power. Everything had been a top-down relationship from the top. And, and there still is that mentality. After you've done that for a thousand years, it's hard to switch. Yeah. Third was the idea that, that they took the messages. Um, Russia would tell you that they could become a capitalist country but they misinterpreted what capitalism was, you know? And what they did was they allowed a number of the un, uh, oligarchs and the oligarchs were there by pure political chance because they supported Yeltsin when he looked like he was gonna lose uh, uh, the election. Um, they supported him and they got, they had the chance basically to control the economy and they did. And so the people who, who controlled it centralized the economy and they maintained the centralization. And it didn't allow, because at any point, if you're a small entrepreneur, the tax police can come into you. They can basically stop your business. They can declare that, you're, uh, that your contracts are false. You have no protection from the law. You know, and that's the reality. I mean, that's the reality in Russia. And that, um, and I, I could do a number of stories, but I won't. But, you know, it just, um, they've not allowed a legal system because for capitalism, you have to have trust in the government. You've got to have trust in courts. You've got to have trust in the law. And you've got to have a belief in the set of rules that are followed by everybody equally. And they don't have that. You know, okay. and so it never developed in the way that it should have. But the okay. potential was there. They just couldn't do it. Okay. Um, this questioner wants to know, who is waiting in the wings when Putin goes? Is there a chance that Putin would be overthrown? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Putin's greatest fear is that the people around him, not the Navalny's, but the, the, they're called the non-system opposition, but they basically can be controlled. They can, you can put them in prison, which is what they've done. The greatest fear is that the oligarchs will think on personal wealth that he's worth. Now, now there's, there's a couple of factors here. There are a number of people that are potential, but A, they've changed the law so Putin can stay in for another couple of terms till 2036. B, what does Putin wish to do? Because nobody can guarantee how long you're gonna live or how long you wanna stay. And if Putin leaves, is he gonna be protected? He could be killed the next day or his, his fortune disappear. And he's probably the wealthiest person in Russia at this moment. C is the idea about, about if you replace him, there's no chance, there's no guarantee that you'll get a better person. 
that you could get somebody worse who's more, and the guys around Putin are called the Siloviki, which means the men of steel. And they're the people out of the KGB or the what's well, now the FSB, which are the, they're all the people, they're all the guys, and they're mostly guys out of the security services. And many of them are more violently anti-Western than Putin is. And it's difficult to think about, but it's real, you know, it's reality at the moment. So you've got the factors of, of maintenance of position. You've got the factor that Putin could be overthrown. Nobody is guaranteed a position. And believe me, um, the one thing that the fights against Navalny have shown is that it's the maintenance of authority and power, which is more important than the country. I see. All right. Um, this questioner says, in 1991, I took students to the Soviet yeah. Union. At that time, the most educated appeared to be the poor, uh, the least compensated. Yes. Uh, we visited a nuclear scientist who didn't have a change of clothes. Has that situation changed? Uh, and, and what uh, Russians are very highly educated. Why does there not seem to be a correlation with uh, uh, yeah, commercial prosperity? Well, two things. One is because a number of the uh, a number of the people who were the high academics went into business, and a number of them did well. Secondly, is that a number of the fields that were highly respected in the United States, the lowest, the two lowest paid occupations in Russia were being a doctor and, um, uh, let's see, being a, uh, being a doctor and probably being a teacher. Um, and that's because they were both female dominated. And Russians were basically sexist. And I shouldn't say were, are, probably are is probably a better phrase on this. And that what happens is that, is that many of the people who were the, who were the most educated traditionally um, were not in the power occupations. And, and as you went to centralization of a number of the industries, um, one of the great issues in Russia right now is, is that the IT and the internet and stuff has allowed a number of people who are younger to come into the economy and try to become you know, entrepreneurs on that. And many have succeeded. And for many, it's been difficult. And many have gone to the West or in Germany or the Sergey Brins here or the other people. There's a friend of mine who has a book out on uh, the Silicon, was it the, uh, on the changes in Silicon Valley and on basically the Russian entrepreneurs in the West where many people felt that they couldn't have a future there. So they left, you know, we've got up to 50,000 Russian speakers in the, in the Twin Cities and in Minnesota. And part of it's the fact that they just didn't feel there was a future. And so they came and there are many of the leading doctors and accountants and realtors and other people um, within the economy of the Twin Cities. And those are people that were lost to the economy of, of the former Soviet Union. So there is, some of it was sexism, some of it was the idea about there's some of that still exists, you know, and teachers are still paid very poorly, even university professors, you know, it's not, um, um, there was this moment years ago, I was sitting in a school and I was the first outsider to be in this school in a rural town. And I said to the teacher, I said to the principals, we're having tea and we're cookies and we're sitting in her office. And I said, um, I, I said, I know this is an implant question, um, but how much are your teachers paid? And she told me the sum and I said, how can they live on that? She said, they can't and moved on to the next subject. Mm. So my wife, my wife, who's one of the top mathematicians in Russia, well, I remember when, the, when we started, it was, uh, I think when she was getting paid $7 a month as a full professor. And she was yeah. making more money doing, you know, teaching people about how to pass the math test. And eventually she quit the university when she got tenure and, you know, went into business because there was no future, you know, economically, you know. And so a lot of the people who basically were entrepreneurial got out of the lower paid occupations. And many of the people who stayed in the research institution were the ones that didn't have an entrepreneurial spirit. Okay. Um, 
All right, well, we are rapidly running out of time and I apologize to those whose questions I'm not gonna get to in the remaining time. Uh, they're all good questions and I'm just trying to take as broad a, a, a range of them as possible. Uh, so, do you see Putin as having strong influence over Trump? And the question that so many people have wondered, did Putin have something on Trump? Um, I mean, like uh, outstanding books from the Ramsey County Library. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, um, my belief was, yes, that some of this was, some of this was Trump's ego, that he thought really that he could do, could do the real estate deals in Russia. Um, I suspect there were some other things in terms of loans and in terms of finances. A good share of the investors in Trump properties have been Russian. The people who purchased condos and stuff were Russian oligarchs and were Russian billionaires in, in Miami and in, um, in New York. And so I believe there's two levels that are here. What is what's real? And that I can't tell you. Secondly is what's perceived, which sometimes becomes reality. And that's the Russians really believe uh, this is a two sided thing. Putin hated Hillary Clinton so much that he would have taken anyone in the world to get rid of Hillary Clinton. Secondly was the idea that after, that by 2020, Putin and the Russian oligarchs were really mixed. They couldn't guarantee that Trump wouldn't try and kill them off the next day. They had no trust in Trump's ability to be stable, but they didn't want Biden because they knew what they were getting. And, that, and the problem was, was that that was a terrible choice for them, which is why they had lesser activity and the fact that they could be discovered in 2020 than they did in 2016. They, the Russian attitude is, you know, why did you do it? And the answer was, because we could. You know, and so you get to this process where with Trump, they thought they were getting somebody who would make special deals with them. And that really reflected the United States. And it didn't work out that way. And in fact, the weirdness of this is, and I, and I say this as a person who's, an, I, I think it's safe to say I'm not a big Trump supporter, um, that Trump raised a number of issues that we have to deal with the Russians, even though we may not agree with them. And that was, and every, every lie has a 5% factor of truth in it. You know, and so when you get to the point where the Russians thought they were going to get into something, um, and there may have been a bait and switch here, and or it may have been the fact that the Russians hated Hillary so much that that they were willing to accept him, and then they discovered that it wasn't. So they, the Russians, have had a really tough time in the last election because they wanted a better relationship, and their better relationship was to be left alone in the Ukraine, to be admitted to everything to have their sphere of influence and to be seen as a major power and to be allowed to do what they wish. Um, and, and that's not exactly the way it's gonna work out. Okay, well, I'm afraid we have come to the end of our time. Thank you so much, Todd Lefko, for a great and most interesting discussion of Russia. Um, I also wanna thank the behind the scenes uh, tech staff that kept things rolling. Yay. Thank you, Paul, yes. <laughs> And I want to thank our audience and invite everyone to come back next week when we're going to be uh, listening to uh, Professor Lisa Waldner of the University of St. Thomas, who will be speaking on the strategies of white supremacists. But for now, I want to thank you all and we'll say goodbye until next time. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.